thanks again, um, Linda and Julian, for inviting us here to the to the seminar. We think it's a great platform for us to share our research finding and also to to discuss them, um, especially at the end of the session. So really looking forward to your comments and and your feedback. Thank you very much. So um, I will be presenting the paper, the effects of decarbonizing institutional portfolios on stock prices and carbon emissions. And it's a joint work um, with Marco Wilkins and Martin Rohleder, who is here today as well. So as the title already implies, we're talking about decarbonizing uh, institutional portfolios. So decarbonization of portfolios is a claim which is very often raised nowadays. Um, so investors should decarbonize their portfolios. There's even a investor initiative called the Portfolio Decarbonization Coalition. Before we dive in into what it really is, what, what decarbonization really is, let's talk about what it tries to achieve. So basically, um, by decarbonizing your portfolios, you want to drive GHG emission, emissions reduction. So this is what the PDC, the Portfolio Decarbonization Coalition says. So you want to have a real impact on the firms. You want the firms to reduce their carbon emissions. And also Climate Action 100 Plus, which is also a very big investor initiative, they want to ensure that the world's largest GHG emitters take necessary action on climate change. So again, investors want to do something in order that companies take necessary action. So they should care about their environmental impact on, um, they should care about their environmental impact. And another investor initi initiative called the Principles for Responsible Investment. Also, they want to enable signatories to improve the real world by encouraging investment and contribute to a prosperous and inclusive societies for current and future generations. So again, investors want to have a real impact on, on the economy, so on the companies that they uh, fight climate change. <clears throat> and imagine you are a shareholder. So you are an investor and, and you, are, you are invested in a company and you are not really happy with how the company is doing. So basically how it's environmentally doing. So because they pollute a lot, so they have high carbon dioxide emissions and you are really satisfied, dissatisfied and you want to do something. You want to, to impact the companies. So basically you have two options. And I'm, um, I hope or I think most of you are familiar with those options because you, you heard the voice versus exit paper by Professor Hart. Um, so basically you have two options. So on the right hand side, you can either um, do shareholder engagement so shareholder engagement means that you uh, meet with the management, you talk to them, you maybe file shareholder proposals, you uh, engage in proxy voting. So you try to, to, to turn the company around from, from inside of the company. And another thing you could do, and this is the second option we will be focusing on today, is called divestment. So basically an exit strategy so it means you are not engaging anymore. So you go out of the companies, you sell your shares. So you do not want to have anything to do with this company anymore. And this is today our focus. And um, let's just define again what divestment is. So divestment already says the word is the opposite of an investment. It simply means getting rid of stocks, bonds or investment funds that are unethical or morally ambiguous. So unethical or morally ambiguous in our context today means that those stocks, those, those corporations are harming our environment. And we do not want that because we are uh, environmental, environmentally aware investors. So it means you, you should sell your shares of those companies. And this is a, a movement uh, which is very popular nowadays. <clears throat> so this, this figure here shows the evolution of commitments towards fossil fuel divestment. So before we, we have a look on the figure, this is divestment is, is a very, very old approach. It's, it, it comes basically from, from 50 or 100 years ago when um, investors fought against racial segregation. And for example, in South Africa, and people said, investors, you should divest from those companies because they are exploiting uh, the people. But today um, we talk about a different kind of divestment. We're talking about divestment of fossil fuels. So it is targeting to, to combat climate change. 
And this figure shows here that it's very, very popular. If you have a look on the, the black line here <clears throat> in 2020, we have around uh, 14 trillion US dollars uh, that are committed to divest from fossil fuels. So this is a really a huge number. And also the number of committed organizations, this is uh, the second axis here, uh, shows that around 1,200 institutions uh, have committed so far um, to divest from fossil fuels. So they want to fight climate change. And on the top right here, you can see Robico. And this is a very uh, um, new example from September 2020, that they are cutting fossil fuels companies from mutual funds. So you see that it's really happening and it's really popular. And I, I think I'm not risking too much if I say that this trend is going to continue in the future because we are more and more aware of climate change and how it affects um, our living. So let's just wrap up. So we know what, what uh, decarbonization, what it wants to achieve. So we want to have an impact on, on the economy, on the real world. Basically, we want to impact the environmental behavior of the firms. And we see that it is, it's a huge uh, movement. So a lot of investors uh, want to do it. But it's a little bit strange, right? Because you are exiting the company, so you go out of the company. But what you basically want to do is you want to influence the company. So this is a really counterintuitive at first. So there's a lot of research going on how to get from divesting to having an impact. And it's really not, not, not easy. And a lot of uh, uh, literature is, is um, conducted here in, in this research field. So how to, to get from divesting to having impact. And there's one model, which is a, a very old model. And I will just give you an idea how you can get from divesting to having impact on the companies. Because I know it's not very, uh, it's, it's not very intuitive at first. So the, the paper I'm referring to is uh, from Heinke Krause and Zechner from 2001. So very old model. And it's called the effect of green investment on corporate behavior. But nowadays, on the last two or three years, a lot of theoretical models um, are built on this model. So it's, it's very, uh, uh, very up, uh, up to date because a lot of people use it in, in their uh, theoretical models. And what it basically says, I will give you an idea. So what does the, the, the study say? So imagine you have a, there's a company A, just a, just a random company. And it's a very dirty and a very brown company. So it's polluting a lot. It's, it's harming the environment. And this company is owned by two different kinds of investors. So they are preference neutral investors. So they do not care about the environment. All they want to do is they have, want to have uh, financial performance. So they do not care if this company is dirty or not. However, the, the second kind of investors are investors with green preferences. And those investors care about uh, the environment. So they, let's say they have a utility function which does not only include financial performance, but also the environmental performance of the company. And those investors do not want to be invested in, in a brown company. So this is the status quo. So before divestment, we have 70% preference neutral investors and 30% investors with green preferences. So now divestment comes into place and those investors with green preferences sell their shares because they, do, they don't want to be invested in this company, but they cannot sell the shares among investors with green preferences because no one wants to have them anymore. So they will share, uh, sell their shares to preference neutral investors. And after divestment, it looks like this. So the company A is now fully owned by preference neutral investors and all of the investors with green preferences went out of the company. So imagine now you are a preference neutral investor. So you, you are invested in the company, <clears throat> but you're not really happy because um, if you want to sell your shares again, you cannot sell it to, to all of the investors. You can only sell them among preference neutral investors because those green investors are, do not want to buy them anymore. And the paper says that this is a lack of risk sharing. So there are fewer investors available to hold the stock of company A. And this is a risk for a preference neutral investors because there's a smaller investor base. And those preference neutral investors, they recognize this and um, they're not really happy 
they want to be compensated for taking this, this risk. So what they do is they demand an additional premium for holding this stock, um, which has a lower in investor base, and they raise their expected returns. So this is also very well documented in the theoretical literature. And this leads to, to for the company, it leads to a cost of capital increase because of higher expected returns. And share prices reflect that and share prices drop. And again, this is also shown, uh, for example, by Pass Sustainable and Taylor, Taylor in their equilibrium model. And now imagine go on the other side. Now you are a manager of company A. And what you experience is that your share prices drop. And also it's not good for yourself for, for being a manager because often your own compensation is linked to share price performance and you have less money in your own pocket if share prices drop. So if you are a manager of the company, <clears throat> you have two choices. So either you, you do not react, so you, you live with higher cost of capital. So you have, let's say you have increased a increased proportion of cost of capital due to lower stock prices, or you can react or you do react and transform the company at a certain cost of transforming. So these are the two options you have. And a manager decides whatever is higher. So if the cost of transforming, for example, is lower than the increased cost of capital, it, the manager has a real incentive to transform and to make the company greener. <clears throat> and making the company greener would mean that those investors with premium preferences would come back to you and your share prices would go up again. And for example, what can you do to make your company greener? You can, for example, replace the old machines with new ones. So the old machines, they're very energy intensive, use a lot of en energy, and you can buy energy efficient um, machines. So this is basically what, what the model says, what Heinkel, Krauss and Zechner say, say, how to get from divesting to impact. So divesting leads to, for the preference neutral investor for, for higher expected return, they demand higher expected return, share prices drop, and the company has an incentive to, to transform and to get greener if cost of transforming is lower than increased cost of capital. And like I said, this is a very old model. There are other models as well, which are very new. For example, I already mentioned uh, Pastor Stambo and Taylor. So they say that investor, investors' tastes for green holdings make firms greener. And they, they uh, use the model from Henkel, Krauss and Zechner and extend it. So it's, a, it's the same uh, channel because greener firms have higher market caps and lower cost of capital. Another paper from Angelus Senkov and Zerbib, I'm not sure if I pronounce it properly here, uh, but I think you heard it in a seminar as well. And so green investing spurs company to reduce GHG emissions by raising cost of capital. So again, cost of capital uh, leading to, to a trans transformation of the company. And especially when the proportion of green investor is high, so a lot of green investors are, are in the market and their environmental stringency increase. Umkem Opsay, there's a, a little bit of a different logic here. So, so far we said that companies can become greener if they have an existing level of production and they make, the, make it greener. For example, they replace old machines with new machines. But Umkem Opsay that investors can have an impact by enabling a scale increase for clean production. So they affect the growth, growth of those companies. And this is only possible if investors uh, relax their financing conditions. So if they demand less, uh, less return for, for, giving, for giving money. So those three models or three uh, studies are related to, to theoretical equilibrium frameworks. There's also a second strand of literature, which is more fo focused on divestment. So Bond and Kutch Birchick show that institutional investors are already divesting based on carbon emissions. So it's already happening. Big institutional in investors, including mutual funds, are divesting. And there's significant div divestment in the US and in Europe. Uh, similar, um, Berman Scalema showed that pension funds that deviate from benchmark weights, so which are basically very active, have lower carbon footprints. And they conclude that uh, pension funds are actively decarbonizing their portfolios. And the effect is driven by a reduced exposure to carbon intensive industries meaning that they divest from those industries, they underweight those industries. And 
The last study I want to mention here is, is uh, very closely related to ours. They uh, argued that divestment announcements, so not the real selling, but only the announcement itself, lead to a long-term negative abnormal returns of those announced uh, divested stocks. So they say that already the announcement communicate, communicates something like a dissatisfaction. And this dissatisfaction is, is maybe new to the market and other market participants, they take this information and, and they maybe they do the same or something like this. So it leads to long-term negative abnormal returns through a communication effect. And so divestors can influence share prices um, of those target companies by divesting or announcing to divest. So our study today uh, fills a, a research gap <clears throat> because we do not focus on announcements of, of decarbonization. We, we focus on real decarbonization transactions. And we test if those real transactions are related to lower stock prices and lower carbon emissions. So lower carbon emissions B is what we, or what the divestment movement actually wants to achieve. We, it wants the companies to transform and to become screener, but we have to have lower stock prices first in order to have the incentive because they would only transform if they have a higher cost of capital. So share prices uh, go down. So this is why we look at stock prices and carbon emissions. So, uh, like I said, we want to have real decarbonization transactions. So uh, we have an empirical study. So we have to have real data. So real, real selling transactions. Um, investors are selling um, very dirty stocks, and we we had a thought on or, or a discussion on which institutional investors investor is best to look on, and we came up with actively managed mutual funds, mainly because um, of four reasons. So many investment companies committed to decarbonization. So for example, like Rubico, so there is or should be something going on um, within those mutual funds. Also, they have restrictive disclosure, disclosure requirements, meaning they have to report to their investors. And this is why we have holdings um, data available and we can track what did, they, what did they buy, what did they sell, which is very important for our study. We focus on actively managed mutual funds because then we have active in and divestment decisions. So if we would focus on ETFs, for example, so we should not see active um, decisions. So here we argue that fund manager, they, they have a discretion to, to buy or sell uh, stocks. And uh, maybe the most important reason, uh, mutual funds manage huge amounts of money. So they are a big player in the market and um, I think about 20 or trillion US dollars are invested in mutual funds. So very, very, very big in, uh, institutional investor group here. And what is our goal? Our goal is to identify decarbonization sell trades of actively managed mutual funds. So selling brown stocks because you want, the, because you're divest and you do want the companies to become green. So basically decarbonization sell trades, how do we identify those sell trades? We use a approach here by um, Cole and Stafford from 2007. They analyzed this in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a flow perspective. So mutual funds that have um, high outflows have to liquidate their position, position. So they have to sell stocks and um, they analyze flow driven um, cells and we analyze decarbonization driven cells so very similar and we can use this approach and we extend it also a little bit you can, we will see that later so two steps to identify decarbonization cell rates first we identify decarbonizing funds and second then we have a look on those decarbonizing funds and on what did they buy and what did they sell so first identification of decarbonizing funds we use, uh, for this purpose, we use a metric um, recommended to use for asset owners and asset managers by the TCFD. The TCFD is the task force on um, climate related financial disclosures. And they say that um, funds should be assessed by, by the weighted average carbon intensity. And what is the weighted average carbon intensity like the, 
the word already says, it's a weighted average of the carbon intensities of the stocks. So of the holdings, what, did the, what does the fund holds in, in, a, in a quarter, for example. So here you can see um, the portfolio weight multiplied with the carbon intensity of the stock. So I indexes the stock, stock here. And carbon intensity is also defined by the TCFD as scope one and scope two emissions divided by net sales. So what are scope one and scope two emissions? Just very quick. Scope one emissions are direct emissions. So big utilities com utility companies are um, generating electricity and they burn fossil fuels and the, the CO2 goes out of the chimneys, for example. These are scope one emissions. But scope two emissions are a little bit in a different log logic. So these are consumption of those energies. So not a generation of energy, but a consumption. For example, if you light up a light bulb, you need electricity. And the electricity, when it was generated, it emitted carbon dioxide. So uh, they argue that if you consume electricity, you are partly responsible for those um, carbon emissions as well. And this, why, this is why they use scope one and scope two emissions. And you, we divide by net sales because um, higher uh, or larger companies have higher carbon emissions. And we, if we do not divide by net size, we cannot compare companies of different company sizes. So this is why, why they say we should um, make a something like efficiency ratio. So how efficient is the company turning one gram of carbon dioxide into one dollar of net sales. So we use this carbon intensity to um, calculate our WAG high. I will just call it WAG high. It's a little bit strange, but I don't know how to pronounce it properly. So WAG high portfolio weight times the carbon intensities. And what we actually want to do is we want to identify decarbonizing funds. So we look um, on the changes of, of this metric of the, of the WAG high. And we argue that if a company heavily decreases its work high, then uh, their fund is a decarbonizing fund. However, um, the work high can change due to two aspects. Just my picture is right here. If we ha have a look on the equation again, we see that the work high can change either due to changes in the portfolio weights. So the fund manager is um, overweighting or underweighting, so in or divesting from companies, and due to changes in the carbon intensity of the stocks. So of the, of the stocks, so for example, scope one and scope two emissions go up, um, or net sales go up, or something like that. And we argue that active decarbonization should only be related to changes in the portfolio weight, but not due to changes in the carbon intensities. Because carbon intensities, it's, it's, we argue that this is unexpected for a fund manager. We, so he doesn't know how the carbon intensity changes. So only changes in the WAG high that arise due to shifts in portfolio weights. So we, we split this, this up and we extract a proportion of the WAG high change that is active and that is passive. And for identifying decarbonizing funds, we use only this active WAG high change. And then we say the 10% funds with the highest active decrease in the WAG high in each quarter, so we have a quarterly perspective, um, are decarbonizing funds. So let's have just a quick example. So imagine you have 10 funds in, in the universe, very, very simple um, assumption here. And we do now do know this active WAG high change. Then we would identify 10%, so one fund as a decarbonizing fund. So the fund with the highest decrease in the active work high. So this would be fund six here, for example. And we will come to fund six later. Um, so this is how we identify decarbonizing funds. Now, second, the second step was that we um, identify within decarbonizing funds, decarbonization solid rates. And we could argue, for example, that all of the stocks that fund six sold uh, are decarbonization sold rates. But then we would, for example, if Fund 6 also sold Tesla stocks, and, and Tesla shares our Tesla, the Tesla company is, let's say, mainly considered to be a green company. So then we would count the selling of Tesla as a decarbonization sold rate. 
And we do not want that because we say this is not a real decarbonization trade. This happened within a decarbonizing fund, but it's not really related to decarbonization. So this is why we imposed two other restrictions for the identification of decarbonization cell rates. So for each cell rate, we check if the sold holding belongs to the top five dirtiest holdings within the portfolio. So imagine you have a portfolio and uh, we have, we, we do know for every, uh, every holding the carbon intensity. And now we rank them according to the carbon intensity. And we argue that only the top five, the dirtiest holdings, if they were sold, this are, uh, or this can be considered as a decarbonization sell trade. So not selling Tesla shares, which would be uh, at the bottom. So only the top five dirtiest holdings. And why we use top five, I will come to this, this later in a descriptive statistic, but we argue only selling very dirty stocks are decarbonization sell trades. And another restriction here, the carbon intensity of the sold holding is greater than the WAC of the fund. This is a, a necessary condition in order that we, if there was a, a sell trade and we have the WAC of the fund and if the carbon intensity is higher of the WAC high uh, compared to the WAC high, then selling this holding leads to a decrease in the WAC high. But if you have it the other way around, then it would not be the case, right? So this is also a, I think a very logical um, restriction here to say the carbon intensity of the sold holding is greater than the WAC high of the fund. And then we conclude if both conditions are met, uh, this can be considered a decarbonization cell trade. So let's go back to our example. So go back to fund six. Fund six was a decarbonizing fund. And like I said, um, we have a look on the on the sell rates, on the, on the what did the fund buy, what did it sell? And imagine now the fund six has, fund six has four stocks within its portfolio. And of, he, he bought 10 shares of stock one, he sold 30 shares of stock two and so on. So we would only consider um, sell rates as decarbonization sell rates. So we would not identify those two buy rates as a decarbonization sell rate. The DST stands for a decarbonization sell rate. And among those two sell rates, we now have a look on our two restrictions that I just described and have a look if they apply or not. And let's just assume for stock two, it applies. So it was under the top five holdings and the carbon intensity was higher than the work of the fund. And then we know um, the number of sold stocks due to decarbonization by fund six. And stock one, zero, because this was a buy trade. Stock two, 30, because this was a decarbonization sell trade. Stock three, again, buy trade. Stock four, a sell trade, but it was not a decarbonization sell trade. And we do this not only for fund six, but also for all other decarbonizing fund, funds in this quarter. And then we can aggregate information. We can add this up. So imagine another fund also sold um, shares of stock two. For example, fund 30 uh, sold 50 shares of, of uh, stock two. And we have 30 sh uh, sold shares from, of fund six. And we know 80 shares were sold in the quarter uh, due to decarbonization. So and this helps us to go from a fund level to a stock level, <clears throat> because then we know um, for each stock in each quarter, we know the number of shares that were sold due to decarbonization by the total mutual fund market. And so we have, um, we come up with three groups of stocks. Uh, the groups, the first group of stocks is our main group, our main uh, group of concern, stocks with heavy decarbonization sell pressure. So those stocks were heavily sold by the mutual fund market because the mutual funds decarbonize themselves. And we have two control groups that are stocks with heavy general sell pressure. So those stocks were also heavily sold by the mutual fund market, but the selling was not related to decarbonization. So for example, they were sold because there was a, a negative earnings surprise or some, something else happened. We do not know it, know it, but they were also heavily sold. And our second control group are stocks without any buy or sell pressure. So this is, we should not see much going on with, with those stocks. And now we have a look 
we make a event study and have a look if the mutual fund selling has an impact on stock prices and carbon emissions. So again, carbon emissions, this is what the divestment movement wants to achieve. By decarbonizing your portfolios, um, the, the company should transform and should show um, lower carbon emissions, but only if stock prices um, go down. So, so we test now if our three groups of stocks, we, we use event studies and look on stock price and carbon emissions. Before we go to our empirical results, let's just have a look on the data that we use. So we have a sample period from 2010 to 2017. We have mutual fund holdings from 4,600 actively managed domestic US and European equity funds. Um, we get the data from Morningstar and Crisp. Crisp is a merged data set. And we use um, stock level data for around 10,000 companies, also US and European companies, of course. We obtain stock prices and accounting data by Refinitiv and WorldScope. And most important, we get carbon emissions data. So we need carbon emissions in order to calculate the carbon intensities of the stocks um, by three major carbon data providers that are Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, Refinitiv, and Sustainalytics. And we merge them all together, those, those three um, um, uh, data sets. And so we have a coverage, a total coverage of 9,954 companies. <clears throat> So before we, uh, now we go to the empirical results. Before we um, have a look on the event studies, let us uh, let me just show you one descriptive statistic because I think it's very important uh, to have a look on. So this is a figure here, a descriptive statistic, which is not, not very easy to read. So I will guide you through here. So we have a portfolio weight and we have a record contribution and we have a, a rank. So what we basically do in, in, in this um, descriptive statistic is again, in, for each mutual fund, for each portfolio, we have a look. So we rank the holdings according to their stock level carbon intensity. So we have a look which one is the dirtiest, which one is the greenest. And if, if it here displays rank one, then this is the dirtiest holding um, of all portfolios, mutual fund portfolios. So, and the dirtiest holding of all mutual fund portfolios on average uh, has a portfolio weight of 1.5%. And then we calculate the WAC high contribution. So the WAC high contribution is the proportion of the total WAC high that comes from this holding. So the, 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 how much of the, of the holding is, how much the holding is responsible for the total WAC high. And here it is 24%. So this can be read as follows. So if a fund manager decides to decarbonize and he sells the dirtiest holding, which represents around 1.5% of the total portfolio, the fund manager can decrease its WAC height by 24%. So this is huge. So you only um, sell 1.5% of your portfolio and your WAC height drops by 24%. So this is very good, or very easy to do, let's say like this. And if we aggregate all the information and look at uh, rank one, two, three, four, and five, so all together, then we say that uh, we see that they represent a point, uh, around 7.8% of the portfolio. And by divesting those stocks, the WAC height can be reduced um, by 58%. So a lot of potential here. And basically, from this figure, we can conclude we have two conclusions. The first one is that the hypothetical decarbonization potential, so we do not see if they are really divesting, but we see that they could divest. So the hypothetical decarbonization potential is huge. So they can easily, the funds can easily decarbonize. And second, um, if a fund manager decides to decarbonize, he would mostly concentrate his uh, divesting on those very dirty stocks. He would not divest Tesla because this is not good, uh, doesn't bring you much for your WAC high, he would divest the very brown companies like let's say BP, Shell, ExxonMobil and so on. Because this brings him a real reduction in the WAC of 24%. Okay, so now we jump to our uh, event studies. 
So again, we have our uh, three groups of stocks. So stocks that were heavily decarbonized, stocks um, that are also heavily sold, but not related to, to decarbonization, and our no si uh, seller buy pressure sample. And we first have a look on uh, share prices, and then we have a look on carbon emissions. So <clears throat> first, stock returns, so, so share prices. Um, this is again not also not a very easy figure if, if you just see it so it's very hard to read so I will um, guide you through again. So we look on cumulative abnormal returns here. Cumulative means that we add those returns up over time and abnormal means that they are industry adjusted. We also use risk adjusted returns as well, but here in this figure there are industry adjusted returns. And we have a event period. Event period is the heavy selling by the mutual funds. And for the for our high decarbonization sell pressure sample, it means that they're sold heavily due to decarbonization. And for our high general sell pressure stock uh, samples, it means they're heavily sold due to other reasons we don't know. So let, let's have a look on the share price development. So first, our, our main concern which is high decarbonization cell pressure. So before the event, so 12 months before the event, the returns, they don't do much. So they, they fluctuate here around zero or minus one, but right during the heavy selling, so in these three months, the, the, the funds heavily decarbonized and sold those stocks, share prices dropped drastically from minus one to let's say around minus 3.5%. Uh, and Maybe more interestingly, more, more, more fascinating than even after uh, the heavy selling, the trend seems to continue. So, not only during the heavy decarbonization, so also afterwards, share prices have a, a negative or have a downwards pressure here up to, let's say, 15 or 16 months. And then share, uh, the share prices flatten out here at, at a new level. So, mutual fund decarbonization has a significant effect during the, the, the heavy selling. And also afterwards. So, in, a, in the context of Heinke Gauss and Sechner, so those preference neutral investors that are now invested in the stocks demand higher returns, which lead to, to lower share prices. Let's have a look on, on, our, on our control samples, so high general cell pressure stocks. So, those were also heavily sold, but not due to decarbonization. We see that also before the event, stock prices here face downward pressure. Um, for example, if we interpret uh, high general sell pressure stocks as stocks with a negative earning surprise or with a profit warning, that some market participants anticipated that there's something negative going on and they already sold those stocks, creating a downwards price pressure. And then within the heavy selling by the mutual funds, the effect is not as, stro sorry, not as strong as for um, the, the decarbonization selling. And after the information was released, so the profit warning was released maybe, or a negative earnings surprise, then we see that the information is, is priced in and here that stock prices flatten out here or settle at a new level. So the difference between those two lines here, this is really our divestment effect. And uh, our no buyer sell pressure sample, they fluctuate here again around zero plus one, so they are not affected by, by heavy selling because they are not heavily sold. So this is just a control sample here. So first conclusion is that decarbonization leads to long-term negative abnormal stock prices of divested stocks, what we see here, not, not only during the selling, but also in the long-term. So now we know that those stocks or the, the manager of those companies, they have incentives to react. So they have, because they face lower management compensation and higher cost of capital, for example, and they have a theoretical incentive to, to reduce carbon emissions. But now we, show, uh, we have a look on if they are actually doing it. So again, the same event study, but this time uh, we use, instead of cumulative abnormal returns, we use uh, cumulative carbon emission changes. And again, same, same study here, we extended our survey period here in, in this event study, because we argue that um, it takes time for the, for the management of the companies to implement carbon efficient technologies. For example, you have to order the machines, they have to be installed, 
and it takes time in order that the decrease in carbon emissions is reflected in your annual carbon emissions. So it takes a little bit of time. This is why we extended the survey period. Again, we have our three um, stock groups here. And let's have a look first on those uh, two control samples. So in general, there is a increasing trend in our sample of those two, two stock samples. And those high general cell pressure stocks, they do not react um, to the heavy selling because the, the heavy selling was not related to the dirtiness of the, of the companies or if they were very clean or very dirty, that was due to other reasons, maybe financial reasons, profit warnings and so on. So there's no incentive for them to decrease carbon emissions because this, this was a, another reason they were sold. But those high decarbonization cell pressure stocks, they heavily increase the carbon emissions before the event, but then the event seems to, to trigger something. And then uh, even so, the carbon emissions seem to stay here at a new level. And most importantly, in the long term, so this is what we ex would expect, in the long term, uh, they are able to decrease the carbon em emissions. And again, this um, difference between those two lines is our divestment effect. So not only having uh, the mutual fund decarbonization having an impact on the stock price, but also it's, they seem to have impact on carbon emissions because those companies want to transform um, because they face um, higher cost of capital. So these are our two event studies. Um, we conduct several robustness tests. I would just uh, mention a few of it. So we control also for other factors that could influence carbon emission changes. For example, there was a change in, in production levels uh, and so on. And we also have a look if shareholder engagement is uh, partly responsible for our effect. And we see that the main effect is driven by the investment, not shareholder engagement. We have a look on statistical significance of our results as well. And like I said, uh, we also use risk adjusted returns that are industry adjusted returns, and we see the same patterns here. So it works pretty well. So it suggests that our, uh, our, our findings are robust to, to several tests. And um, to sum up, um, we find support of the divestment movement. So our main findings are that the hypothetical decarbonization potential is huge. This was this figure with those two bars. Um, and the investment is likely to be concentrated on very few dirty holdings. More importantly, mutual fund decarbonization lead to long-term negative abnormal returns of those divested stocks. So share prices drop and companies face higher cost of capital. And most importantly, mutual fund decarbonization leads to a better environmental performance of divested stocks in terms of uh, lower carbon emissions. And our practical implications are um, that next to engaging the company, which we had a, a look at first, so voice versus exit. So voice is a valid instrument, but also green investors seem to effectively have an impact on the environmental performance of brown firms by divesting and by decarbonization. So thank you very much for listening and paying attention. I'm really much looking forward to, to the discussion. Hi, this is Florian and, and thanks uh, for, for uh, this, this great presentation, really an interesting paper. And also thanks Martin for already uh, answering some of my questions. So, I mean, this is a quite strong finding. I think that decarbonization actually of portfolios actually causes decarbonization in the real world. I think that that's a, a heavy debate right now. So, so I'm, I'm really thinking about, I mean, causality. I mean, uh, some of my questions went, went in this um, direction. So couldn't it just be that some funds are just good in, in kind of predicting like uh, price iteration of, 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 of fossil intense companies just being better at other funds at really looking at climate policy that's ahead and, and, and market developments. And then this leading, I mean, at the same time to, they, they have, they, they sell these funds. So there is kind of sales pressure, but then actually some of these predicted price drops actually happen. I mean, so can you kind of exclude this effect in, in some way? Yeah, so thank you very much, Florian. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, so what do we know that uh, share prices, for example, we, if we have a look on the share price and they seem to not react before the event, 
Mm. So right in the event, um, we argue that this is the selling is related to the decarbonization. But you're right, it could be that also um, there was something else going on. For, for example, um, financially, they perform not, not, not good and the, the stock returns are expected to decrease. Uh, what we do is that uh, we, we control for this effect by excluding companies that had a, a positive or negative earnings surprise, for example. So those stocks do not drive our results. So we, we try to exclude the financial argumentation, like I just said. Um, so mutual funds sold them because they were expected to perform Q in the future by excluding um, stocks with, uh, with negative earnings surprise and also with profit warnings. So mm -hmm. we try to, to exclude as much as possible, but still we do not exactly, we, we do not because we have to interact with the fund manager to know exactly what the motive is he was selling it. So our, our model, our framework tries to, to address the best possible, um, or we, we, do, we, we do some effort to try to address it as best as possible to, to exclude the financial argumentation, but uh, at least we do not know it for 100%. For 100%. Because I mean, just maybe one comment on this, there's this nice paper, pharma, kind of this, this model that if you have preferences, this will affect price, I think very much in line with the theoretical work you presented. But what strikes me in this paper is kind of that, that hetero, uh, heterogeneous uh, beliefs are look very similar, like preferences, at least in the beginning. Of that if... Yeah. And it has some implications because if, if, if it's really kind of the preferences that drive down prices, then the implication would be that more investors could do the same and then it would have the same effect. If it's beliefs, then it's not really an implication you can give to investors to do the same in terms of impact, maybe in terms of performance. Then. I mean, uh, what I already uh, said in the chat, uh, what we also do is that we compare this group of um, stocks uh, with high carbon intensity, which are sold um, heavily, um, with high carbon intensity stocks that are not sold heavily. Um, and if there is a shift in preferences, purely because these are high carbon intensity stocks. These should show at least some um, resemblance to the stocks that are sold heavily and with uh, preferences and, and they don't. So mm. don't see the, the same um, cumulative abnormal returns for these not pressure high carbon intensity stocks. Uh, and that's also a way that we try to yeah, get rid of this um, endogeneity problem. Yeah. So, so you say basically if there would be kind of general events upcoming that some funds predict that affect performance of carbon intense funds that should cover for that. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Is it maybe possible to also look at bond portfolios? I mean, for one, um, I think fossil fuel firms or some manufacturing firms are more capital intensive and therefore more likely to be able to sort of get capital starved but also i think bond investors are more risk averse um theoretically yes we could um we also have holdings information on european and u.s um fixed income funds however the working with these um Fixed income fund holdings is much more complicated because the secondary data on these on these bonds is much more um, complicated to acquire. So um, we're concentrating on equity here, uh, but yes, of course, uh, this could also be an interesting question to to follow uh, to do this with uh, with bonds, oh. especially the the question um, whether um less uh, possibilities for uh, companies to generate um, foreign capital or uh, debt capital um, maybe leads to faster uh, transformation of the firm than with uh, equity capital yes thank you i wanted to 
ask something about the <clears throat> the prominence of this wacky approach, uh, you know, right now and also in the period that you study. Um, Right in the beginning, you showed these figures of, you know, so and so many trillions um, due fossil fuel exclusion. But I was thinking, okay, wacky is not really fossil fuel exclusion, right? Because basically fossil fuel stocks are excluded on the basis of scope three emissions. And you look at scope one and two and it's relative to revenue. So um, my question is, well, twofold, you know, sort of how, popular is this wacky based uh, trading in the market right now? And uh, have you thought about showing a similar effect, you know, just purely for the fossil fuel industry? Yep, yeah, um, I'm gonna take this one. Yeah, very good good question. So the wack high approach is, is a very popular one because TCFD is, is very popular. And if they recommend asset owners and asset managers to publish those, those figure, then it has some prominence. And also additionally, the, a lot of ratings and, and, and scores of, of mutual funds are based on this metric. Mm -hmm. So if a fund manager wants to perform well on those ratings and scores, he would trade towards this metric. So he would try to minimize the, the work high as, as much as possible. I, I agree with that, but the period that you study, isn't that before the wacky hasn't even been defined? Yeah, so I think the wacky so became some prominence around 2014 or something like that. Um, so a little bit later, but still mutual funds could be orientated towards this, this metric and also uh, also from maybe another explanation from a risk perspective. So they, they want to exclude high carbon intensity stocks also earlier because they are aware what would happen with those stocks because of stranded assets or something like that. So there's something already in 2010 or 2011, we argued that it, there could be something going on. I, so, but it leaves me with the, so I, Okay, so maybe funds have been looking at this metric a lot, but just from my experience with, with you know, ESG products, sort of the common, the most common thing is just an industry screen. Um, and I just, maybe it, it, just because you motivate, you know, you'd use it as a motivation and I, I, I see why, right? But, uh, but maybe the figures um, presented there are, my feeling is they are probably mostly related to um, screens that just look at industry affiliation rather than carbon intensity. Um, and it's an important differentiation in terms of, you know, what is the cost of changing, right? If you're excluded because you're an oil company, well, <laughs> you know, there's not much you can do about it. If you're excluded on the basis of a relative carbon metric, then, you know, then you can change that. So. Yeah, it's more of a comment, right? In terms of the motivation and to check how relevant is this particular, because you study a very particular mechanism and how important is that in the market today yeah. and maybe also in the period that you study. That was something I was wondering. I mean, um, uh, we, we use the, uh, this measure, wacky, or however you want to pronounce it, yeah, <laughs> uh, VACE. Um, um, we use it to identify decarbonization trades, which doesn't mean necessarily that the mutual fund managers use it to identify the stocks to divest. The mutual fund managers will, if they want to divest uh, from fossil fuel, either look at industry and divest from the industry as a as a whole on a whole, or they will look at carbon intensities. Yeah? Only looking at how much is the carbon emission of this, of this firm maybe isn't, uh, isn't correct because smaller firms automatically have smaller carbon emissions. So they look, uh, look at, which is the most logical uh, measure, carbon intensity. So some uh, ratio of carbon emissions to firm size or in our case, net sales. Mm -hmm. So, so that is what they will in most cases do, or what we expect them to do, and then we try to measure it with this uh, wacky change. 
Um, and that is universal. I mean, it doesn't depend on the, on the period. And then what we do in, in these robustness uh, tests that uh, Jonas also mentioned is that we control for uh, firm fixed effects and or um, industry fixed effects in panel regressions, which we run alongside these, um, these uh, event study um, methodologies. And that doesn't change the, the results much. So um, even if they use pure uh, screens uh, based on the industry, then uh, our results don't go away. Maybe I can just add from, from a practitioner side at AZKB, um, this is exactly the, the figure we look at, the carbon intensity, and we try to reduce it for the whole asset management for all the active portfolios. And the portfolio managers um, uh, on purpose do not just want to exclude certain subsectors. It's about doing it um, most, um, doing it as neutral, as sector neutral as can be. That's the goal. Did you have a look at, at which companies have a particularly high decarbonization pressure? I think that would be really interesting to see which companies get affected by this and whether they differentiate by other fossil intense companies or. So I think we, we made a list with uh, the stocks that were most often decarbonized. And these are the stocks you would uh, expect to be uh, most decarbonized, very, very big uh, fossil fuel companies, uh, high carbon emissions, both scope one and scope two. Um, so I would answer this is basically, so those companies you would suggest, uh, Chevron, for example, ExxonMobil, but we do not list them in the paper because uh, we think it's very dangerous to do it. Um, <laughs> but we had a look on it and, and the results were as expected, yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, can you uh, maybe uh, uh, name some numbers? How many uh, companies are in our high carbon decarbonization uh, sample and how many are on this list um, of, the, of the ones that are, that are decarbonized for, or for which we have decarbonization event quarters um, of more than four? Uh, this, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it was around, I would say 100, something like this. On, the, on this list? Yeah, or 70. And, 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 uh, or 70 and, and 600 or 800 firms that are overall divested over this period, which have this e these events with high carbon pressure. Mm -hmm.